What am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about manufacturing and talk about how our frames are made because it's a cool story. Okay. Yeah? That'd be great. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Welcome to the Swifty Podcast, a conversation about inspiring positive change through design, innovation, and technology. Hi, welcome to the podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about how we make our frames because it's quite an interesting manufacturing story right it is so i hope you enjoy it uh please like subscribe share if you're listening on itunes or if you're listening on youtube then thanks for joining us let's get stuck into it yeah okay go so we started uh um with a steel frame design and Mm -hmm. that was primarily because uh, steel tubing is readily available in the UK. As naff as that sounds, it's very real. Remember, we were looking, should we do steel, yeah. should we do alloy? And um, I made the original batch production out of the steel uh, tubing that we could buy, basically. The idea was to launch the first product off um, a shoestring, which we did, mm-hmm. and also by using off-the-shelf sizes and components to make it mm. easy. So the whole lean manufacturing concept, which is designing and engineering and manufacturing something as lean as possible. So without having to delve into investing in tooling, which we'll come in common to in, in a little bit. The idea is, you remember, it was yes. about trying to make it as easily as possible. So we chose steel. Easy because for you, maybe. Very difficult for most people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. Well, yeah, all right. Isn't it? It's, well, thank you. Yeah, that's that's a compliment. Yeah, honey. it takes some skills to make a foldable yeah. steel frame. Yeah, but exhilarating in the same sense. So we started with mild, good old mild steel. Yeah. Um, and we, do you remember when I actually made those first frames? I, I, yeah. I manipulated those frames by filling them with sand, yeah. wedging the end of the tubing up and then heating it up. Um, with the oxyacetylene torch and then hand bending them. Do you remember that? That's how we made them. Yeah, well, it was a while back. No, well, yeah, nearly and 10 then, years ago. Then when we the volumes increased, we um, found a local supplier, didn't we? That's right, yep, yep. Um, local here in Manchester. Uh, we prepared all the tubing and did the welding yeah. for us and powder coating. That's right. Yep, that was the original. And we still did the assembly right here mm-hmm. in Salford. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it was just you and Mark, wasn't it? Mark um, did the assembly. Yeah. Yeah. So we we originally started with steel, if you remember, because it was readily available. So mm-hmm. it was an easy way to kind of get going. And the steel scooters were fabulous. They were great. The um, In the cycling industry there is kind of this constant back and forth of what's better is is aluminium better is steel better is carbon better and the truth yeah. is that they all have different properties don't they mm-hmm. and so uh when we were looking to then scale up production and move the production of uh, our frame sets over to taiwan that's when we started looking at changing to aluminium and so the, there are some key differences between steel and aluminium um Steel is more forgiving. It kind of can move uh, when you're riding. I mean, it's um, it doesn't bend or flex, but it well, yeah, it kind of does actually. It has a little bit of flex, doesn't it? Yeah, a little bit of flex. It kind of uh, you know it, it'll move. Um, I've actually got but also some, it's heavier. It's heavier, yeah. So I just looked up some stats because I don't know these off the top of my head, but um, just that we are factually correct. But steel is typically two and a half times denser than aluminium. So what you get with a steel frame is that because it's denser and it's stronger, you can get away with thinner wall sections. Mm. Um, Some of the bike frames, you can get a really thin wall. Yeah. Steel frames, aren't they? Yeah, so they're like the the typical kind of Reynolds steel frames are really thin. And it's actually really incredible how they make those. I've been in a factory do you remember me telling you about how, was, how, how they were welding those tubes together, mm. how they were filling the tubes with water mm. to keep the steel cold? Oh, wow. And then they TIG weld the frames. Right. And then water kind of dribbles out. What about brazing? Do they 
Yeah. So brazing is a different type of process. Uh, you use this kind of like flux, which covers the the, the, the frame to keep air away. Um, uh, it's a little, a, a little bit like soldering. You use a, a big a big torch, and um, you basically dab the the the, um, the brazing rod into mm. the area where you want it to to join the parts together and it kind of flows in and it's almost like an osmosis process. It kind of sucks into the frame um, and that's what joins the two things together. But it, it doesn't, so the differences in welding is that it doesn't, the brazing doesn't really penetrate the steel. It kind of adheres to it. Mm. So it's almost like, in some ways, it's like gluing it together. Um, whereas when you TIG weld or you MIG weld, which is a different process, you're actually penetrating the metal mm -hmm. so you're melting it and fusing new metal together we're going off on yeah. a tangent here should we try it's and bring it back yeah is i guess so uh, well it's fascinating to me and I, I hope other people enjoy it i i, I love manufacturing so steel in the uk is more accessible isn't it yeah it's, it's not only more accessible it's it's it, more accessible there are there are there are um fabrication processes that are set up uh, which are readily available. So laser cutting, for example, mm -hmm. you can get, there's lots of laser cutting companies out there that will laser cut some steel tube. Mm -hmm. And um, you can, so you have two types of, of, well, you mentioned, you mentioned a couple of different techniques. Uh, there are many different techniques of how you can join two bits of tube together. Mm -hmm. So you can, the traditional one is a butt, butt weld. So um, it's where you... <laughs> What are you, you laughing at? <laughs> I was seeing you were going <laughs> to laugh. I thought you were going to laugh, but I crack first. Um, so with your butt weld, <laughs> you basically notch the tube. So it's it's two round tubes going together. And uh, so it creates like a saddle. And if you imagine uh, taking... Um, how can I explain this to the audience? I'm just listening to the audio, so it makes sense. So if you were to... When I say notching, people want to know what a notch is. So if you were to take two tubes and one tube could cut the other tube, if you put that tube on top of it and then cut right through, mm -hmm. the resultant profile would s sit nicely on the tube. So that's, that's what a saddle is called. So it like notches up together and then you weld around. So it's got a perfect joint. So it's flush. So those two tubes are flush together. So that's a, a butted joint. Um, you also have a lugged weld. So it's where you have a precast component and you slot your tubing into it and then you weld around it. And that's how you create a joint. And then our technique, which we use is kind of a mixture of the two. I'm not going to publicly on air say exactly what it is because that's kind of a trade secret for us but the resultant effect is you get a very strong and durable frame so yeah all the different processes are really interesting and one of the great things about what we do is we take the techniques that exist out there and we apply them to our design process and i think we should talk a little bit later about the key differences differences between our products right and mm -hmm. other products and what makes swifty um so different because we're going to come on to that with the cost and it's all these little details that i'm talking about now is what you're really buying into it's going to give you a much better performing product and something that'll last much longer right because mm -hmm. we've always wanted to try and um make it about the ride it's all about the ride and how it's maximizing the experience to be an awesome, awesome experience. Yeah, but so don't forget, as well as the ride, it's about come having, closer to your microphone. As well as the ride, it's about having a really elegant design that people, yeah. you know, fall in love with. That's really important, yeah. isn't it? Because yeah. you can have utility yeah. and you can have something that looks good. Yeah. But when those two worlds come together, that's yeah. when you get a real magic. Yeah, you well, that's get some what the, good design is, isn't it? Well, yeah, but I think, I, I, well, it is in our perspective, but I think when you look out on the market, the scooter landscape, you see these, even the automotive industry. So BMW have done some concepts, Mini have done a concept, and I can spot with those frames where they've made sacrifices for would-be design intent to make it look beautiful. But the ride's going to be awful. Right. 
And it's like, mm-hmm. what if you guys can't get it right? Then we we we're really we're really hot in terms of what we can do here. <laughs> You know, so I guess that's blowing my own trumpet a little bit, but it's just years of experience, isn't it? We've, we've, yeah, so let's, nice let's go back to, them. let's go back to Mark 1, Swifty 1. We made it out of steel and then we moved, didn't we, our production? Yeah. Uh, so we moved to Taiwan mm-hmm. and we made our frame sets in aluminium. And we did that because aluminium's way lighter than steel. Um, it's about a third of the weight of steel. Mm-hmm. So that's quite a lot, lot lighter, but it's not as strong as steel. So remember, steel's two and a half times stronger. So you have to make your wall thicknesses of your aluminium frame thicker to compensate for the loss in strength. Um, and making a steel frame, I can tell you, is way simpler than making an alloy frame because uh, when you're making an aluminium frame, the beauty of working with aluminium also is that you can process aluminium relatively easier than steel so you can cut aluminium it's softer than steel so you can cut it uh, you can shape it you can mold it you can post finish it if it's a softer material you know it's it's easier to process so that's why people also like working with it so when it comes to the actual material itself itself there's a number of different grades of aluminium that you can get and i won't go into that but in the bike industry there's 6061 which is just a, a code i guess a reference and then the 7000 series so 7005 is another grade of aluminium that is used in the cycling industry so when we were coming to look at what we were going to use we looked at the benefits of both and 6061 is uh, very popular for a good reason that's because um it withstands corrosion and it withstands fatigue quite well and the whole supply chain is used to working with it so why specify a material that's really expensive and difficult to process you're just gonna open yourself up to mm. issues problems errors yeah so but don't forget the other thing about aluminium is that mm-hmm. it's stiffer isn't it so you don't get that flex yeah it has yeah yeah, all and, aluminium is, is stiffer. Than, and that's important for scootering, why? So when you are kicking and you are propelling yourself along the ground, on a steel frame, you'd get that little bit of flex that we said before, remember? So you'll lose some of the energy due to the flex. Every bit of loss of energy means loss of propulsion. So over a, dist- a longer distance of time, that stiffness means you can transfer your energy into the scooter and go faster. Yeah, so it's more efficient. Yeah, it's more efficient, yeah. More efficient scooting mm-hmm. yeah, to have a stiffer frame. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the new frames are great, aren't they? You, yeah. Like when you get on an old one, when an old one comes in, you're like, what, did we make this? This is, <laughs> yeah. this is, this is nuts. Yeah, so we're super happy with the new ones. Yeah. Aluminium frames. Yeah. Um, I but just they do have um, cool. steel front forks. They still have steel front forks. And the reason why they have steel front forks is because of the safety standards. So uh, with the BSEN safety standard that we conform to, there is an impact test on the front fork. So you get an an adult rider and he literally puts on a load of body armor and he has a little wall, which is about one and a half foot tall in the testing facility. (laughs) And he just rides full pelt into the wall (laughs) <laughs> and the scooter hits the wall and he goes over onto a load of crash pads and he wears like a whole load of stuff. Yeah. And it's to test whether the fork will bend backwards under mm-hmm. front impact. And, you know, like a little dri- uh, the, on on your, your can of cola, the drinks tab, yeah. where you can pull it back and forth, back and forth really quick and then it'll snap. That's what fatigue is. And what you don't want is that to happen remember we said before that steel will bend and move mm-hmm. well if you do an impact test on a steel frame it's just going to bend and maybe tweak a little bit you do it on alloy and you can only do so many of those at high impact and it will fatigue and then it'll fail so we still make all of our forks out of steel for that reason um the only exception is the swifty one marine mm-hmm. which is the lightest currently the lightest folding scooter we do a 7.8 kilos and that's because we wanted to make that as light as possible and it's also designed for the marine environment um so having a steel fork would mean it would be open to 
corrosion. But we'll cover that later, I guess, in when we go through the range. But it still meets the safety test, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So that the reason why that that um, meets the safety test is because the the steerer tube inside is pretty much solid. So it's way ah. more expensive to make. Right. The alloy that's, fork. That's why the price is a lot higher. That's why the price is a lot, a lot higher. And I'll, I'll just say now, when it comes to price, it's always for a reason. We're not like, you know, a luxury handbag, which is made by the same factory, making a cheap handbag. And it's just about the brand name. It's it's for a reason. It's because they're all expensive parts to process and uh, expensive yeah, parts to process. I've said that twice, sorry. Um, yeah. Because it's all about quality. It's all about longevity. So the other thing I want to talk about with with uh, aluminium, which is cool, is understanding also the post-treatment. So um, we extrude our aluminium frames. So all of the profiles, uh, the shapes of the tubes are our design. They're what we design. And we own a whole load of tooling, which is like a a big, um, like a, what, how could you explain uh, extrusion to someone that wouldn't know? Uh, a little bit like how... It's a mould, isn't it? It's a mold type. Yeah, so you kind of, you push a huge bit of aluminium, you squeeze it through a big steel tool and it will extrude it out to be a, sh a specific mm. shape. So I guess like, you know, when the kids have one of those Play-Doh machines where they put Play-Doh in and they pull the lever and it extrudes a star yeah. shape, it's a little bit like that. Yeah. So we make all of our tubing, they're all, all of our tooling, we own that, and we do it to our design, our specification, our wall thicknesses we specify, the radiuses of those wall thicknesses are all take contemplation because we're always thinking about the stress and strain that that tube is under and trying to deflect the energy around that tube so the loading is equal across the entire mm. frame. So that's... In the design process, that's all taken into account. Then we also take into account how those tubes intersect and go together, how they're welded. Uh, we even take into account how much welding is done on each part, because when you weld two bits of aluminium together, um, 6061 aluminium in its raw form is pretty malleable. It's mm -hmm. actually, um, when I say malleable, you know, it's not, not like you could just, rock up and bend it but it's malleable in respect to the end state that it ends up in being which is the end scooter which you'll know so when we extrude all our tubing then we go off to then um, cut the tubing into the specific profiles we notch the tubing where it needs notching um, so they all fit together and then it goes over to the welding facility and our tubing then gets put in these huge welding jigs uh, there's many of those that we have so we can produce en masse. And there is one special person in that factory, and uh, he's the, the the frame setter. And that guy, what he does, or girl sometimes, um, he will tack all the tubes together so that they're in the right location and they're in the right angle in this in this jig, in this, this mold. Um, and then he very carefully puts them onto a, a set of frames and then they go off to 10 or 20 welding tables where guys will just sew up the 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 the, the, the way the weld needs to go so if it's a ring yeah. around two tubes or if it's internal they'll then do that bit so what happens when you weld the frames together our frames is that the bit where you actually weld that 6061 goes hard because it's had heat that goes into mm. it through the welding process. So the welding process is you send a current through the metal, it basically melts the metal and you put a filler rod in there, you add add material in. Um, and so by by doing that, you the, the metal, as I said, gets hard and it will also warp as well. It will heat creates the tubing, the tubing kind of moves. So this is now done out of a mold. It's not done in the mold. So what happens after that is you get all these frames that are slightly a little bit warped, a little bit, depending on the temperature, the ambient temperature of the room, um, et cetera, et cetera. Humidity, it all affects it. So you have to be sensitive to your environment as you're, you're welding. And, and a good welding shop knows that. And so what happens then is it goes off to be um, treated. And it, the first process is called a T4 process. And that T4 process is where you take the frames 
and then you put them in a big oven up to 480 degrees Celsius uh, and they're left in there uh, for a, a number of hours. And what that does is it basically reheats the entire frame and it makes the whole frame um, a, it brings it back to its original malleable process. So all the, where the welds are, where all the welds are, they all, they all kind of go, not soft, but they, they're not as hard as they were before. Then what happens is we have a whole load of new to, uh, tooling, um, which is called alignment tooling. And so we take our frame and if, let's say the S-bend, which is our main big tube, which goes from the head tube down to the foot plate, if that's slightly off, we then have a, a, a set of tooling, which is just big lumps of steel, which allows you to then manipulate with these levers the tube to be perfectly aligned back to where it needs to be. And so that happens for every single part and connection and component of the frames and the forks. We did the rear forks as well. Um, so what happens then afterwards is we've got them back to the original shape. They've been welded. Then they go back into the oven and they have what's called the T6 process, which is a similar process again. Um, and the frames are, are heated up to 180 degrees Celsius for eight hours. And then sometimes depending on the ambient environment, um, they're allowed to cool naturally or sometimes they're put in a liquid bath and that bath brings the temperature down slowly. And what that does is it makes them hard then. It makes them stronger, strong and hard. And that process is really important and it's kind of like a, a dark art. That's a very basic overview that I gave you, but there is a science to it. And um, the supplier that does it for us is, is obviously very good at, good at what they do. And so the resultant effect is you get a a really tough, really strong, um, amazing, amazing frame that will last a long time. So mm. all of the design of the frame, the way we engineer them, um, it's designed, like I said before, it's to try and spread the load that the rider is putting the scooter through, through the entire frame and try and have it even. Yeah, so the process is... Same as the bike industry, isn't it? But it, yeah. but because of the open frame, mm -hmm. actually, it's m more difficult, isn't it? Because you don't you don't have that the strength of the top tube. Yeah, it's know. it's all yeah, it's it's a lot more difficult than making a bike frame. Yeah, so the typical bike frame is a double diamond, so it's two it's two it's two um, two triangles together. Yeah, and that's what they call it, a double diamond, uh, and that's inherently very strong triangles the strongest one of the strongest shapes when you put two of them back to back you get a very very strong shape um a scooter doesn't have that it's completely open it's almost like taking a triangle disconnecting one of the joints and then saying right make that strong yeah so it's more difficult isn't <laughs> it's it? very difficult yeah so what you're getting with our products is something that is meticulously thought through and designed and engineered in every level so every level of the manufacturing process we have an input to try and make sure that we are following the engineering principle to make it strong and durable and mm -hmm. we work together with our suppliers to try and figure out how can we make this the best possible product and that's that's the big difference so a lot, the, the way that we make our frames most manufacturers would would wouldn't do it won't do it we've we've been we've we've gone to suppliers because it's, it's very it's very difficult to do and when uh, you're right. when you when you're running Just technically difficult it's technically very and it's very highly skilled as mm -hmm. well so like the foot plate tube which connects to the s-bend like you have to weld inside a tube quite deep down in there put a little tack in there to actually get that component to work the way it does most most machine welding uh, suppliers won't won't do that They'll, they'll sell, they'll do it, but then they'll skip. So then when we get a batch of screens back and we cut them up to have a look what's inside and test the penetration and see mm -hmm. that it's not been done, you, like you, re you can reject that whole batch. And so they don't want to go through that because if, you can imagine that if you've got a welding supplier, that their throughput is really important to them. You know, they want to get as many frames done as possible in the shortest amount of time. 
So anything that takes longer and is technically more difficult, you're going to you're going to have a higher number of rejects if your staff aren't skilled enough to do that or you don't have a management structure to manage the production process to make sure mm-hmm. you don't get any of those errors. So that's why we have multiple checks at every single stage of the production process to make sure that none of these points have been missed. And ultimately that's why you've got, you know, our scooters that I've been out there for five, six years and they're still going strong. Yeah. So we did the, um, the questionnaire mm-hmm. a few months back mm-hmm. and a couple of our customers do so many miles. We were like, wow. <laughs> um, you know, there were several of them, weren't there? You yeah. do, you know, 10 miles a day on the commute. Mm-hmm. So that's 200 miles a month, you know. What, what was the what was the miles uh, a year? Yeah, what was <laughs> loads? The, what was the uh, we 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 worked out it was six point nine million miles, right? Is the yeah, total we, number we've estimated <clears throat> how many miles people have scooted on Swifties since we've started the company, and we got to um, six point nine million miles. Yeah, Jamie worked that out, didn't he? Yeah. Well done, Jamie. Same that was, as 277 that tough working that. times around the world. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Wow, that's nuts. That's a lot. And actually, we also asked if people were swapping their car journeys mm-hmm. um, for scooter rides. About 40% of that is swapped car journeys. 40? Yeah. That's really high. Yeah. I've not the rest even seen... is for fun, I guess. <clears throat> Are you writing this up in a report? Uh, you've not you've not done it yet. Not done it yet. We've used yeah, we've used the good facts in the blogs. Okay. Cool. So that's kinda of like how we make our aluminium frame sets and the steel frame sets and why we've chosen to go that route. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to kind of just go on to um we've kind of explained why and that's because it's we're just trying to make the best riding experience. We always put that first. And we design it and we ride it. We're scooter riders. Yeah. And I don't know, I bet there's loads of scooter designers who don't ride their own scooters. Do you reckon they can't, that's true? They can't, they can't do because if they, if, they, if they did, then they'd be like, this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> we need to make some changes. <laughs> and actually, that, that's a good point. I, I think, who are you referring to? I'm not you going to you you drop names on, you on mean a podcast. Cheaper, small wheels, scooters. Even some of me. the big brands that are out there. You you see them, as I said earlier, and you you can just you can just look at it and you kind of go, mm, they've not got that proportion right. right. Let's I tell you what. Let's let's talk about geometry because geometry yep. is important. Okay. So we've covered frames, how they're made, which is cool. Uh, geometry is super important because when we started the Swifty One Mark One, the geometry was really unique. Like no one else was making a scooter like that. And so, what do I mean by that? Well, most of well, let's start with where did the larger wheeled scooter con- mm, yeah. concept come from, and give um, give an accurate portrayal of that. So, kick bike. Yep. is a Scandinavian brand and they they've, are... They've been around for longer than us. A lo- yeah, a long time. Yeah, I think yeah, they maybe started in the 80s, I want to say. I might be wrong about that, but quite a long time ago. And they were um, originally uh, founded by, I believe, a doctor. And that doctor oh. was a big cross-country skiing um athlete and fan mm. and he wanted a way to train in the summertime when there was no snow so he designed the concept of the 24 inch front wheel 16 inch rear wheel scooter and so that frame design and geometry pretty much mimics the posture and the position that you're in when you're cross-country skiing right so it's kind of like they wanted to train to get fitter and stronger yeah. and so having a very low foot plate to the ground, that kind of hunched forwards position, which is kind of like, imagine you. More sporty. Yeah, imagine when you're, you know, when they do their kind of pole plant and they're kind yeah. of boom, boom. I mean, they're some of the fittest athletes in the world, aren't they? And it's quite a similar um, body motion, isn't it? Yeah, yeah rhythm. Yeah, similar, similar rhythm. Sim- similar rhythm. So you, you swap legs, obviously, and um, it was really successful. But what happened was because he 
uh, or they invented that concept. Then all the other brands that came along, so there's some um, Eastern European brands uh, that are mm-hmm. doing similar kind of products. They kind of not copied the geometry, but followed the same suit. And yeah. it makes sense, you know. With a large bike wheel, it looks like a bike mm-hmm. up the front, but then goes down to a smaller wheel at the back. That's right. Yeah. 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 So they, they mimicked that geometry uh, because it, it obviously was out on the market and it was selling, but they didn't, they didn't question why. They didn't question why that was like that. And so my approach when we were originally designing Swifty One was, well, we're not cross-country skiers. We want to put the riding experience at the forefront of the experience for the customer mm-hmm. and make that the guiding principle for what we're in, what we're gonna what we're gonna produce. And so we looked at this idea of we want it to be comfortable, we want it to be feel really floaty and nice. So the relationship between the wheel length, so the wheel base, the, the distance between the wheels, the wheel size, so what size wheel are we gonna choose? Uh, and the head tube angle, which then informs the rake of the front wheel or the fork. Mm-hmm. Then, uh, and the body posture as well. And the body posture. So our geometry is still pretty unique on the market. Yeah. And nobody else really makes a geometry like ours. And that's why ours, well, it's not why, but it, but ours still, I think, remain one of the best geometries out there for our kind of customer who's not looking to break an Olympic record or train as a cross-country yeah, skier. you don't need Lycra for a Swifty, do you? <laughs> well, they can if you want. Now, now, come on. What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't wear Lycra either. Um, <laughs> but it's so, for so sort the, of modern living, isn't it? So it's inner city suburban well it was when we were designing it wasn't it that's yeah. what it, it was very much a almost a selfish need it was like well what would i want to ride out ride around on so just coming back to so we've covered like kind of frame design coming back to like the geometry that's really important to explain why it is the way it is so we looked at the larger wheel we knew we wanted to have a folding product for the urban dweller the urban customer yeah the big wheeled scooter just doesn't fit in your way it's massive it's can't take it on the bus no so it needs to be folding so we looked you remember we looked at 8 inch 12 inch 14 16 18 and 20 and we tried all those wheel sizes some of them in reality with through prototypes and some of them just on computer and we quickly we quickly realized that to get a comfortable ride 16 for an adult is the smallest wheel size that you can really get away with because if you go smaller, then every lump and bump on the road, you really feel through the frame. So when you go smaller wheel size also, your frame's smaller. So the distance between your hands, where the handlebar is, and the head tube yeah. is longer as well. So you basically want to have a shorter a shorter distance between the head tube and the handlebar as possible. Because right. then you get less leverage through the frames, you get less movement. So it's all stiffer. It's stronger. Yeah. If you think about a bike frame, a bike frame, the stem is literally right on top of the, the head tube yep. where the bearings are that help you to steer. So if you go further and further and further away, then what you get is you get something that doesn't feel as nice. There's always going to be a bit of movement along that length. Mm. No matter what you make out of, unless you make out of solid steel, then it's going to, and you wouldn't because then it'd be really heavy. So it's a, it, the design and engineering process, it's a balance, isn't it? It's like yeah. balancing. So I've always made it akin to cooking. It's like you could take the same ingredients and you get a hundred people to cook the same dish and maybe two or three would make an amazing job because they get the balance of the materials and the flavors yeah. right you need the, the right recipe yeah and that's the but it's not just the right recipe it's the it's the quantities it's like the fine tuning of quantities and if you just get that a little bit wrong then the whole experience is different so mm. that's what we did with 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 our scooter geometry is we tried to get the so balance, it's balance right. between um not too big not too small <laughs> Not too big, not too small. <laughs> um, a little bit more, a little bit more. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, the wheel no, size, right. isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. You yeah, don't want it yeah. too big because then it's not as practical. It's just an annoying object. It's a big yeah. object and you wanted it to be no bigger than a bicycle. 
um, and we wanted it to be. And it's really versatile if you have it that little bit. Well, 16 inch, most versatile yeah. wheel size. Yeah, so, size, I think. so the 16 inch, so do you remember we had the 349 and the 305? wheel okay, size that's, those, that's um, good that's good to explain that's an interesting one we get this question a lot and that's there's two 16 inch wheel sizes there's a 349 and a 305 are either of them actually 16 inches in diameter no <laughs> yeah so this is it's really confusing so we don't we've tried to figure out why and we've asked the industry why are these two sizes and nobody can give a de definitive answer I've got a few um, assumptions myself as why why that could be, uh, but basically, a three four nine millimeter sixteen inch wheel is a Brompton size wheel, Brompton bikes. Shout out to Brompton, awesome bikes. And then there's a three o five, which is smaller, and they um, are still a sixteen inch wheel. Uh, so some of our customers get confused because they'll buy a tire or an inner tube from somebody else, and it says sixteen inch. But, but it's, it's a 349. Right. It's a 349. Sorry. So our Swifty One Mark One had the 16 inch 349. Originally, nine. yeah, had 349. Same as the Brompton. That's right. And then we changed it. We went to 305 because the tyre selection was better for the air, which yeah. we ended up launching. That's it. And we wanted to make it a little bit smaller and more compact in size as well. Do you remember? Yeah. So we moved, we changed. And you can get you can get better selection of tyres. That's so important, isn't it? Because yeah. The way we select the tyres is also, you know, that's the important feature of each scooter. It all starts with the wheel. It all starts yeah. with the wheel. And that's what makes me laugh about all the other explosion of scooters that are out there, especially these electric scooters that have got tiny little eight-inch or six-inch wheels. It's like you, you you, you said something funny. There's there's a big compressor that says large 200-millimeter wheels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, like to, they think it's a unique selling point to have large if you just say 200 millimeter wheels <laughs> tiny you just say large that's funny <laughs> yeah we we do a tiny 16 inch scooter <laughs> <laughs> so um, don't be fooled you can't cheat geometry you can't cheat science you can't cheat physics like wheel length geometry really really matters and wheel size what did I say? Wheel length. Wheel length. Wheel base. The, the, the distance between the two wheels. So the oh, longer... Right. Wheel base. Yeah, wheel base. So the longer the, the longer the wheel base, the more stable the ride is. But then it's a, a much larger turning circle as well. So if you go shorter, you can turn in a mm -hmm. shorter, uh, a, a smaller radius. Yeah. So it's a everything's a balance. It's trying but to it's balance. It's not just about turning, is it? It's about tripping as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if that's you've got a shorter deck wheel, height, deck height. No, that's shorter wheelbase. Your centre of gravity is much closer to the front wheel. Mm, no, our centre of gravity <laughs> is always in the middle between the wheelbase. We don't put it towards the front. No, no, I promise you. No, <laughs> it's not like that. What 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 are you trying to what are you trying to say? If you've got a short wheelbase, then your body is much closer to the front wheel than if you've got a longer wheelbase. So if you hit something, it's much easier to to go over. You mean? Trip. Oh, right. I see what you mean. Oh, yeah. So if you've got a shorter wheelbase but with smaller wheels, it means then you're much closer to the front wheel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I thought I thought you meant if you had a Swifty with a long wheelbase or a short oh, wheelbase. Right. That's what I thought you meant. Sorry. No, you're right. Not a yeah. Swifty. No. No, you're right. Then. So if you've got a small scooter with small wheels. That's completely different geometry, so you don't have to even... There's yeah, many factors. So there's we, also the rake of the, 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 the fork as well. Yeah. They're very vertical. But let's just finish talking about wheelbase because yeah. um, the, the length of our wheelbase yeah. is fairly long compared to a small wheeled scooter, but it's still short enough to like fit in the car boot or still versatile isn't it it's not mm -hmm. like the big um the kick know, bikes the kick yeah. bikes with the large front yeah, wheel yeah sure yeah 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 so yeah, yeah it's that those, balance as well all those it? factors come into how you and design I think it a makes frame the swifties just so safe to ride 
Yeah, they're stable. Yeah. But there's, there's, so the so Rude all right. Well, let's co- let's come on to that. And there's two things we should discuss. And one is ground clearance, and the other one should be um, the rake of the fork or the head tube angle. Let's, okay. e- let's explain those yeah. for people because they're interesting as well. So we do get quite a bit of stick about the ground clearance. And again, this is coming back from the legacy of the kick bike concept, which is very low to the ground to get you as close to the ground as yeah. possible. Like you're on skis. Like you're on skis, which you can't really ride in the city because every tree root, bit of debris, twig will Not catch the under the frame. <laughs> Not the UK. It depends where you are. Yeah, so that 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 would be very nice along a, a very even road, mm, but fast. when you but when you come to a curb and you come to anything that's an obstacle, a speed bump. Yeah, you're going to catch hole. you're going to catch the frame, <laughs> and that can throw you off. So again, our products are not really designed for you know going as fast as you can being a cross country skier. It's a different concept. And so the reason why we have 65 millimetres clearance under all of our frames is because we don't want you to catch something and be thrown off. And it is absolutely true that the higher the footplate, the harder it is for you to work. But guess what? It's a compromise. So stop complaining about it being harder to ride a scooter that's safer for you. (laughs) Did you hear that? Get on with it and train harder and it won't hurt. (laughs) You can't cheat exercise. Like It's a motivational, jazzy talk. Well, it does annoy me sometimes <laughs> the way, you know, we get we get attacked by other would-be scooter enthusiasts. You don't get attacked. Well, they don't get attacked, but they get very uh, enthusiastic about trying to... I don't want to get into a, bait, a debate about it, is ours better than yours. I just want to point out why we designed ours the way yeah, they are. And if yeah, you yeah. want a different product with a lower foot plate go and buy another product then that's absolutely fine it's not a problem but there is a very good reason for it it's because we want it to be safe some customers say they want it lower others say they want it higher actually yeah you're right yeah so you can never win really that's why we don't need to listen to but it's also about balance isn't it (laughs) we like the deck height very diplomatically said yes (laughs) actually there is a there is a there is a plan isn't there in the future to address this issue and we've got a design for it to have this adjustable dropout that we can lower the back yeah. of the scooter if we want to so we, we can anyway that's deck height which is important um the other very long subject of discussion which i'm not going to go into too much detail um is the head tube angle and the rake so that's the other thing that i find mm crazy that all these other scooter companies that are out there they don't take into consideration the hundreds of years of engineering trial testing r&d of people that have thought about how to make the ultimate riding experience through the head tube angle and the Mm -hmm. rake and they just choose to ignore all of that and so they have these twitchy little setups that are very hard to ride and um you can't ride them with one hand for example yeah and that's an important topic actually it's a huge topic um, and and also and explaining why that is like that is a huge topic as well and yeah the stability of the steering um yeah on a lot of scooters that's caused that's what causes accidents people fall off because they just totally. well because they let go they hold on with one hand or for they scratch their nose or something answering the phone waving try and hi film. guys <laughs> <laughs> You know. fall off. Yeah, totally. That but happens. You're never gonna you're never gonna you're never gonna be able to 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 design out human interaction on that level. You you're not gonna be able to do it. So you have to design in a way so that it caters for that behaviour. And it's sensible to do that. And mm-hmm. sometimes you have to make a compromise with, okay, look, I totally get it. Like a tiny wheeled scooter, it's great when you fold it up and you can take it with you anywhere. I don't want to just take it anywhere. I want to ride it. Yeah. So riding it is way more important than when it's folded up. And yeah, okay, it's tiny, it's convenient, but it's only convenient for when it's in that, that form. When it's in the boot. What about all the sacrifices <laughs> you make, the compromise you have to make for having a tiny wheeled scooter? Yeah. You have safety, you have ride. You know, or all athlete, 
you, rattly. Well, we call them teeth rattlers for a reason. It's because they're like that. You know, they're, they are the teeth rattlers. You know. Would you ride one? Would I ride one? What? A That's, small hard wheel scooter. Why would I? Why would I ride one? I've got a factory <laughs> full of hundreds of scooters. What kind I of think question the is that? Is no. <laughs> yeah, but it's not out of principle because if if there weren't any Swifties in the world. Well, Would you go I, out there and get a Well, no, that's why, we, that's why we started the company, because we were looking for one, didn't we? So, are you trying to catch me out in some way? Anyway, right. I'm just picturing you riding one of those little scooters. You want me to say I would never be seen dead <laughs> yeah, on one of those little wheel scooters? You hear that, everyone? <laughs> <laughs> Someone's going to take that and snip it out, and like one day it'll come back and haunt me, won't it? I don't it? think I would either. No. Why are the kids' toys? You just look like an idiot. That's why 10 years ago it was really taboo mm. to ride a scooter as an adult because you look like an idiot. Let's be honest. there weren't any Swifties in the world. Well, not just us, but any other <laughs> option, really. I mean, now there's quite a lot, but there's, there wasn't any other options. And yeah, quite rightly so. You should be heckled for riding pretty much a kid's toy to work. Like, go and ride something that's designed for an adult, you know, and... and, and Anyway, can we talk about the head tube angle? Because that's another really important subject. Yep. And go. Okay, so you've got frame geometry, you've got gla ground clearance, you've got uh, wheelbase length. Yeah. They're all important factors, but probably the most important is the, the angle of the head tube because that enforces the angle of the fork and also enforces where the handlebar is in proportion to you, the rider. Because the, the steeper the angle the further away the handlebar will be to you, the more vertical it is, so steeper. Mm -hmm. The slacker, so the more shallow the fork is, the handlebar will come closer to you. So yeah. we wanted to have quite an upright riding position. Yeah. But we also wanted to have an angle of fork, which meant that the steering was safe at higher speed because our scooters do roll faster than a normal little wheeled scooter. But we don't want it to be too steep so that it would mean that the turning circle is very large, which would then mean it's the manoeuvrability isn't very good. You mean steep as in, you know, roll back like an easy rider cruiser? No, that's that's shallow, that's slack. You said steep. <laughs> so steep is steep, right? <laughs> Have I got it the wrong way around? No, I've not got it the wrong way around. Anyway, more vertical, there you go. Let's do that. Everyone knows vertical. <laughs> vertical straight up. <laughs> so our f head tube angle is a very specific degree, and that's yeah. to make the ride nice and stable at higher speed. Now, that angle also has something called the offset, and that offset gives you the trail. The, the offset on the fork. On the fork, yeah. So if you were to draw an imaginary line in line with your head tube all the way down to the fork and go all the way to the ground and then take that line and offset it forwards yeah. by 20 millimetres. That's where your wheel connects. So what that does is it gives you a trail, which is where the wheel is kind of... It's uh, you, you mentioned it before, the uh, shopping trolley effect, where the wheel is trailing behind the axis. Yeah. And what that does is it means that it's stable. Now, if you've got a very long trail... That's really good for high speeds. Um, but the, so the steering is, is harder to push, like mm. Harley Davidson. Yeah. And then if it's shorter, which... It's more twitchy. Some track bikes like that, it's more twitchy, yeah. Yeah. So we find that the competition that's out there, they have pretty much direct inline wheels. So the, the, the center of the wheel is right in the center of the fork in the steering column. And so the, the steering of that is very twitchy. And again, yeah. this is the other reason why I think there's a lot of accidents on those small scooters is because, yeah, people get them and they kind of wave at their friends or they say something or something's in their hair or whatever. And then they take one hand off. Fly in the eye. Fly in the eye. And then, and then they <laughs> fall. Fly in the eye. What's the worst thing you've had hit you in the face I've then? Had scooting? Fly in the eye. You've had a fly in the eye. But you wear glasses. How did that? Do you scoot with your I glasses on? No. Take them off. Hmm. I don't wear glasses, so I've had plenty of flies in the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I've swallowed a few flies seeing as well, oh. which is pretty nasty. <laughs> but um, 
anyway, yeah, back on to a serious note. Yeah, the so the angle is really important. It's super important for making a stable right. And when you combine all of those things together, you get our overall design, our overall geometry of the scooter. Yeah, so you want it stable. So you want an angle on it, but you yeah. also want it nimble. Yeah. So our. So you don't want it too laid back. Too slack. Yeah. Scooter. So our there's two drivers there there's the offset and the angle and mm -hmm. them in com combination or give you our geometry which mm -hmm. means that when you're on a swifty even if you take one hand off it's stable yeah. you can ride with one hand if you want i mean don't get me wrong it's not like easy it's not the easiest thing in the world but you're not gonna suddenly find that it's dead twitchy and you're not gonna fall off so um yeah. All of those factors combined together are what make our geometry very unique. And it takes. I wonder a, how many of our customers can ride with one hand? Probably quite a few, I'd imagine. I mean, not all the time, but for signaling or. Yeah, well, that's what it's for, is for that moment where you do have to, you Take know, adjust a strap or something on your rucksack or yeah. what, what, whatever, whatever it is. And, and that's what you've got to try and plan. And that's what you get with what we do. Or what we do, we carefully consider all of those different little details which you could totally just overlook in the production process mm. and go oh that's good enough that'll do but what does it do all those little things they all stack up they all add up and then the resultant is a big fail so if you can get as many of the little details right as possible right from the beginning then you're going to end up with a far superior product and a far superior customer experience yeah. than, you, than you would if you ignored all those details. And it's so easy to ignore them. You can, you can kind of go, oh, yeah, we'll just get a, bit of, get a little bit of cost out here. We'll keep that tube straight. And then the result is like, blah. It's like, blah. <laughs> it's just a blah design, you know? It's like, and that's the yeah. difference. It's like going through all of those details. It's painful and it's difficult and it costs a lot of money, but you end up with just a superior experience and mm -hmm. that's what you're paying for when you buy a swifty and we have seen a couple of other 16 inch scooters being made haven't we come and go there's yeah a few come and go come that's and go. right there's that there's a i won't mention the brand but i know i know a brand a european brand that came and they did that single fork thing which i have no idea why people do single yeah, front forks yeah, what happened to them it's just a silly idea. It's just trying to be different for what, right. what what reason? Okay, I'm going to put one single fork on one side. Okay, so it's not as strong. So I'm going to have to make that double the thickness. Just put a fork on both sides. Makes no sense to have a <laughs> single sided fork. <laughs> just try, just trying to be different to make a you know make it look cool. And yeah. Failed. Unlucky. Yeah. Anyway. So I think we should try and wrap this up because we because we've talked for ages about geometry, frame design, uh, a bit and of the production process. Nice colours on top. Nice That's important. That's isn't your it? job, isn't it? What's uh, the best colour we've done? Put it in the comments. <laughs> the, fi the fire chrome is pretty cool, oh, yeah. isn't it? Fire chrome, new colour. This August colour of the month, fire chrome. Fire chrome. It is looking hot. <laughs> it's a pretty hot month. Yeah, it is. Uh, thank you for listening to the podcast. Uh, if you don't already do, please subscribe, like, follow. I'm going to say it, ring that bell, ring which the bell. gives you the <laughs> notification. <laughs> uh, yeah, Camilla said, I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Yeah, please send in your comments. It is great to genuinely hear uh, your thoughts. And we will respond. Yeah, we if will respond. If there's something you really want to hear about, please let us know. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks See you next listening. time. Bye. Bye.